The next assignment is the Teenage Wasteland narrative writing task. You are going to follow along as I read the story out loud to you, and I'll explain what this chart is in a few seconds. You'll be completing this chart, but first let's look at what the directions state. You're going to mimic Tyler's writing style, Tyler is the author's last name, so that a reader cannot tell the difference between which part you wrote or which part the author wrote. So you'll notice that when I read the story, there's no conclusion, there's no ending. So your job as the student and as the writer is to complete or create an ending to the story. And you need to remember to keep your characters consistent, which is why below we're going to analyze characters' thoughts and choices so that we don't completely change up their behavior when we create an ending for the story. Keep characters consistent in terms of how she developed them. Keep adding to the meaning and overall message of the story and come to some type of resolution to the conflict. And the meaning or overall message of the story can also be called the theme. What is the theme of the text? So first we're gonna focus on characterization and you'll see that I included a chart here for you that's color coded. Anything that you see that's highlighted in green in the story is something that's related to Don, the character of Donnie. It'll be something he does, his behavior, or it'll be something that he says. So in the first column, you will rely on this word list below to identify the character and it's okay to use repeats. Some words will be used more than once. In this middle column, you're going to identify how the character behaves. And again, I've highlighted the text for you to help provide you with substance, to help provide you with the answer. And then in this last column, you'll include quotes. Identify how this character thinks. So let's go ahead and get started with reading the literature. This story is titled Teenage Wasteland. He used to have very blonde hair, almost white, cut shorter than other children's so that on his crown, a little cow look always stood up to catch the light. But this was when he was small. As he grew, grew older, his hair grew darker and he wore it longer, past his collar even. It hung in lank taffy colored ropes around his face, which was still an endearing face, fine featured, the eyes an unusual aqua blue, but his cheeks, of course, were no longer round, and a sharp new Adam's apple jogged in his throat when he talked. So this statement right here indicates that it's possible the character is beginning to go through puberty and, and certain changes or already has gone through them. In October, they called from the private school he attended to request a conference with his parents. Daisy went alone. Her husband was at work. Clutching her purse, she sat on the principal's couch and learned that Donnie was noisy, lazy, and disruptive, always fooling around with his friends, and he wouldn't respond in class. So here you'll notice that I highlighted two separate sections of the sentence, and it's up to you to stop and take a look at where this information can be plugged in. So anything highlighted in yellow is related to Daisy, Donnie's mother. And it says here, clutching her purse. So this is a behavior. So in this column, you'll write clutching purse. And anything highlighted in green is related to the main character, Donnie. Donnie was noisy, lazy, and disruptive, and always fooling around with his friends. So here's... Donnie's row, we find the behavior column, and we'll type noisy, lazy, and disruptive. And you'll continue to fill out the chart on your own as I read it. You can stop and start this screencast in order to do that. In the past, before her children were born, Daisy had been a fourth grade teacher. It shamed her now to sit before this principal as a parent, a delinquent parent, a parent who struck Mr. Lanham no doubt as unseeing or uncaring. 
Mr. Lanham is the principal of the private school that Donnie attends. It isn't that we're not concerned, she said. Both of us are, and we've done what we could, whatever we could think of. We don't let him watch TV on school nights. We don't let him talk on the phone till he's finished his homework. But he tells us he doesn't have any homework or he did it all in study hall. How are we to know what to believe? From early October through November, at Mr. Lenham's suggestion, Daisy checked Donnie's assignments every day. She sat next to him as he worked, trying to be encouraging, sagging inwardly as she saw the poor quality of everything he did. The sloppy mistakes in math, the illogical leaps in his English themes, the history questions left blank if they required any research. So this yellow information right here is Daisy's supporting or encouraging behavior. Daisy was often late starting supper, and she couldn't give as much attention to Donnie's younger sister. You'll never guess what happened at, Amanda would begin, and Daisy would have to tell her, not now, honey. By the time her husband Matt came home, she'd be snappish. She would recite the day's hardships, the fuzzy instructions in English, the botched history map, the morass of unsol unsolvable algebra equations. Matt would look surprised and confused. So this is the father's behavior. And Daisy would gradually wind down. There was no way really to convey how exhausting all this was. In December, the school called again. This time, they wanted Matt to come as well. She and Matt had to sit on Mr. Lanham's couch like two bad children and listen to the news. Donnie had improved only slightly, raising a D in history to a C and a C in algebra to a B minus. What was worse, he had developed new problems. He had cut classes on at least three occasions, smoked in the furnace room, helped Sonny Barnett break into a freshman's locker, and last week during athletics, he and three friends had been seen off the school grounds. When they returned, the coach had smelled beer on their breath. So this information highlighted in green relates to Donnie's behavior. Daisy and Matt sat silent, shocked. Matt rubbed his forehead with his fingertips. Imagine, Daisy thought, how they must look to Mr. Lenham, an overweight housewife in a cotton dress and a too tall, too thin insurance agent in a baggy frayed suit. Failures, both of them, the kind of people who are always hurrying to catch up, missing the point of things that everyone else grasps at once. She wished she'd worn nylons instead of knee socks. It was arranged that Donnie would visit a psychologist for testing. Mr. Lanham knew just the person. He would set this boy straight, he said. When they stood to leave, Daisy held her stomach in and gave Mr. Lanham a firm, responsible handshake. Donnie said the psychologist was a jackass and the tests were really dumb. But he kept all three of his appointments, and when it was time for the follow-up conference with the psychologist and both parents, Donnie combed his hair and seemed unusually sober and subdued. The psychologist said Donnie had no serious emotional problems. He was merely going through a difficult period in his life. He required some academic help and a better sense of self-worth. For this reason, he was suggesting a man named Calvin Beadle, a tutor with considerable psychological training. In the car going home, Donnie said he'd be damned if he'd let them drag him to some stupid fairy tutor. His father told him to watch his language in front of his mother. That night, Daisy lay awake pondering the term self-worth. She had always been free with her praise. She had always told Donnie he had talent, was smart, was good with his hands. She had made a big to-do over every little gift he gave her. So these were her actions. This is her behavior. This is what she did as she raised her son. In fact, maybe she had gone too far, although Lord knows she had meant every word. Was that his trouble? She remembered when Amanda was born. Donnie had acted lost and bewildered. So I highlighted this because this is some of Donnie's behavior. Daisy had been alert to that, of course, but still, a new baby keeps you so busy. Had she really done all she could have? She longed, she ached for a time machine. Given one more chance, she'd do it perfectly. Hug him more, praise him more, or perhaps praise him less. Oh, who can say? The tutor told Donnie to call him Cal. All his kids did, he said. 
Daisy thought for a second that he meant his own children, then realized her mistake. He seemed too young, anyhow, to be a family man. He wore a heavy brown handlebar mustache, his hair was as long and stringy as Donnie's, and his jeans and his jeans as faded. Wire rimmed spectacles slid down his nose. He lounged in a canvas director's chair with his fingers laced across his chest, and he casually, amiably questioned Donnie, who sat upright and glaring in an armchair. So they're getting on your back at school, said Cal, making a big deal about anything you do wrong. Right, said Donnie. Any idea why that would be? Oh, well, you know, stuff like homework and all, Donnie said. You don't do your homework? Oh, well, I might do it sometimes, but not just exactly like they want it. Donnie sat forward and said, It's like a prison there, you know? You've got to go to every class. You can never step off the school grounds. So this is a direct quote that you should include in your chart from Donnie. He talks about school and says, it's like a prison there. You cut classes sometimes? Sometimes, Donnie said with a glance at his parents. Cal didn't seem perturbed. Well, he said, I'll tell you what. Let's you and me try working together three nights a week. Think you could handle that? We'll see if we can show that school of yours a thing or two. Give it a month. Then, if you don't like it, we'll stop. If I don't like it, we'll stop. I mean, sometimes people just don't get along, right? What do you say to that? Okay, Donnie said. He seemed pleased. Make it 7 o'clock till 8, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Cal told Matt and Daisy. They nodded. Cal shambled to his feet, gave them a little salute, and showed them to the door. This was where he lived as well as worked, evidently. The interview had taken place in the dining room, which had been transformed into a kind of office. Passing the living room, Daisy winced at the rock music she had been hearing without registering it ever, ever since she had entered the house. She looked in and saw a boy about Donnie's age lying on a sofa with a book. Another boy and a girl were playing ping pong in front of the fireplace. You have several here together? Daisy asked Cal. Oh, sometimes they stay on after their sessions just to rap. They're a pretty sociable group, all in all. Plenty of goof-offs like young Donnie here. He cuffed Donnie's shoulder playfully. Donnie flushed and grinned. Climbing into the car, Daisy asked Donnie, Well, what did you think? But Donnie had returned to his old evasive self. He jerked his chin toward the garage. Look, he said, he's got a basketball net. Now, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays... They had supper early, the instant Matt came home. Sometimes they had to leave before they were really finished. Amanda would still be eating her dessert. Bye, honey. Sorry, Daisy would tell her. I'm going to pause the video here, let you update your chart, and the next video segment will be the second half of the short story.